I, uh, good afternoon. I am a uh, man bereft of name tag, uh, Dan Gilman. I work at the FTC's uh, Office of Policy Planning and um, really glad to be hosting a, a terrific panel here this afternoon. Glad to have you all here. A couple uh, quick things. First, as before, we have staff who can collect uh, question cards. If you have questions, um, just raise the cards up or ask for a card. We'll get them on in. Uh, some of them we might be able to read to the panel. Others we'll, we'll take back to FTC with a second. In competition with my colleague James Cooper over disclosures, I want to point out that um, uh, should I happen to say something of substance here today, it does not necessarily reflect the views of the Federal Trade Commission or any individual commissioners or the Office of Policy Planning at the FTC. Whoa. Cool. That was an unanticipated effect of the disclosure. Um, uh, any questions I ask here today do not necessarily reflect the curiosity of the Federal Trade Commission or any of its individual commissioners or any other human person. Um, we have a very fine panel here. I'm not going to read everybody's bios. We have them available in print outside. We have them available on our um, website. I do want to just um, introduce people by name uh, and uh, affiliation and then leave time for them to do a brief presentations of six, seven minutes, and then we'll, we'll, we'll jump into our discussion. So um, moving from my left, uh, Jane Bambauer, who uh, teaches at the University of Arizona, James E. Rogers College of Law. Um, then Avi Goldfarb, the University of Toronto's Rotman School of Management. Uh, Anja Lambrecht of the London Business School. Uh, to her left, Amalia Miller, uh, the University of Virginia, where she's a professor in the Department of Economics. Um, one down, I can't even see over people. Uh, Lior Strahilovitz uh, from the University of Chicago um, Law School. And uh, finally, uh, Rahul Talang uh, from Carnegie Mellon University. So let me just turn the floor over to, to uh, Professor Bambao. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much for including me. Uh, so I'm glad I'm speaking first because uh, some of the gaps in our knowledge of, of how privacy and potential privacy regulation is going to affect innovation um, the, that I'm most interested in are at the sort of highest level of conceptualizing what it is that we're trying to protect when we protect privacy. And this is, I think it's important to get definitions of privacy harms right so that we can then compare them to potential trade-offs with, with innovation. And I thought for today's comments I would, I would, I would actually use the Cambridge Analytica uh, example to illustrate that it's actually quite hard to get concrete and get agreement about what types of privacy harms we, we ought to have the government uh, intervening uh, to manage. And the reason I like using Cambridge Analytica is that almost everyone thinks something went wrong and we all kind of use it as, uh, you know, we all, we, all, we all say Cambridge Analytica and we all nod and we all agree, you know, we all use it as sort of a placeholder for ick. Uh, but if we actually, if we each individually define what we think the problem is that the government needs to solve, I think we'd start rapidly splintering into different groups and could not agree on uh, what, what um, direction to go in. So the first thing that might have gone wrong um, is that Facebook users didn't realize that when they were taking this little personality survey that they were uh, exposing even their own full Facebook profile, including every like that they had ever done on Facebook to this researcher at Cambridge, um, let alone the Facebook profiles of all of their friends, right? So I, I think descriptively that's accurate, that, that, that Facebook users did not realize how much they were waving away when they clicked, you know, when they saw the, the, uh, the, the screen warning them about the privacy implications, and they're like, yes, 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 just get me to the survey, I need the survey. So, uh, so I'm gonna treat the, the, um, the, the, trans, you know, the, the transmission of their data uh, as a decision that Facebook made, uh, and, and I'll come back to the consent idea, but even if we think of this as being, uh, you know, as being ascribable to Facebook, I still, I think, I still think it's hard to, to define precisely uh, what should be done. So is it that the problem is that we're letting anybody, either Facebook or third parties, study people without doing IRB-style informed consent? 
Um, so, you know, inference winds up being at the heart of much of what we love about internet and smart devices and smart services. A-B testing actually involves interventions. I mean, they're randomized control experiments um, that for some reason the industry calls A-B testing. Uh, and so even, even you know, traditional in interventions are a normal part of, of innovation. And I don't think that we want to uh, prevent that from happening or put very cumbersome uh, very cumbersome processes in the way. So then maybe what, what we should do is allow Facebook to study its users in that way, but not permit third parties to have access to that sort of, e either the draw data itself or to the sort of hyper-customization that, uh, that that raw data would allow third parties to do. Uh, well, that gets to the heart of Facebook's and Google's, for that matter, business model, right? So there's a reason that Mark Zuckerberg in his congressional hearing testimony um, rejected the idea that Facebook should shift to a, you know, to a pay service. I think he knows that people, he knows what many of the pe presenters at this conference have, have already said, that people won't actually pay uh, for the services that they get in, in money, even though they will pay in data. I don't think that Congress is ready to kill Facebook. I don't think we should be ready to kill that, um, that uh, sort of business model. And actually, this relates to the opt-out idea. On the last panel, um, there seemed to be at least a little bit of a consensus for, uh, well, when a consumer opts out, that at least should be honored. Uh, and I, I'm not so sure about that. As long as opting out continues to be to happen at a rate of 0.24%, sure, let people opt out. It's a low, small cost that content providers like Facebook, um, uh, you know, can easily handle. But if you know, if John Oliver convinces a bunch of young people, uh, millions of people, to opt out one day, then that business model is, is severely compromised. And so I don't think you know. I, I, Consent itself could, at least if it's legally enforced, um, could could wind up wiping out the uh, payment model that we're used to. Okay, so finally, maybe then the problem is that Facebook can allow traditional advertisers to have access to this data and to use hyper-customized content, but there's something wrong with letting um, not, you know, untraditional content providers like political actors um, have access to the same data or have access to, um, to, to, to targeting in the same way. And this really gets, at the, gets to the heart of the externality that I think many people think occurred with the Cambridge Analytica story. Uh, the line differenti differentiating though, like sort of standard advertising and the kind of content that um, we think is suspect because it might distort elections, that, that's awfully hard. To define, and you know, we're we're essentially what we're do, what we would be doing is asking either Facebook or regulators to identify what counts as a bias or a manipulation versus just content, persuasive or maybe non-persuasive content that people seem to want to view based on their clicks. Um, so this this kind of raises questions that have been studied for, for decades now in the advertising context of created demand. Like is there some, is there, uh, is there something about firm, you know, content providers like Infowars um, that's actually creating um, biases and, 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 um, and demand for certain types of content that it's that is bad for people? Um, or is it that we've kind of all galvanized around blaming Facebook and Cambridge Analytica for a problem that really just kind of is at the heart of American democracy, that, that, that basically that, that, you know, the only problem with democracy is its own voters, right? Uh, so, um, so because all of these, so I'm, I'm raising a bunch of questions without offering answers right now, but uh, so I wanted to show that the way I'm starting to think about this, and I'm sort of in, in the early phase, but, but there is some, some you know, evidence-based to work with, is, is I'm starting to look for early signs of um, times that people may be engaged in a short-term techno panic and may be sort of psychologically uh, and naturally uh, um, geared toward resistance and hesitancy to a, to a technology that they will, in, in a short or medium amount of time, uh, wind up adopting and, and even liking versus persistent forms of privacy preferences that seem to be un nearly universal and that seem to flow and, and be, um, be persistent even when, when technologies 
are changing. Uh, so I can say more about that during the Q&A, but I don't want to take more time. Thanks. Thanks. Hi, I'm Avi Goldfarb. Um, so a lot of these ideas that I'm going to talk about over the next six minutes were, were touched on by various people over the course of the day. Uh, but I want to maybe dig into a few of them to the extent that's possible in six minutes to give a high, high level uh, introduction to these ideas. So when we think about privacy, what privacy used to be was either the paparazzi. It was either there were a handful of people who were declared public figures and they had essentially different rights than the rest of us in terms of um, the communication of their private life. Um, or we emphasized um, uh, security services and the police, and you know, there were restrictions on how they could surveil the public. Uh, privacy is now a business issue. That's why we're here. That's why it's at the FTC. Privacy is a business issue. It used to be almost purely a legal issue or a media issue. Now it's more than that. Why is it a business issue? It's a business issue because of all the uh, data, the digitization of uh, of media and of all sorts of aspect, other aspects of life have enabled. And so what we need to recognize when we think about this as a business issue is we do know already that privacy regulation can restrict innovation, okay? There is, the empirical work so far is that there is a trade-off. That doesn't mean we can't theoretically construct a situation where privacy would enhance innovation. But the, the dominant empirical work so far, um, and this is, you'll, you'll, you'll hear more, more of this later, but this is at least uh, my work with Catherine Tucker, has been that you know, privacy uh, in the online advertising space, when you restrict information flows, well, there's a reason that those companies wanted that information. They could innovate with that information. They don't do as well without it. And that's the theme you've heard. You heard it from Garrett, and you heard uh, a fair bit in the last panel. Um, another thing to recognize, so this is you know thinking about competition, Privacy regulation can help large incumbents, okay? So what do we mean by that? To the extent that there's a, um, it happens in two different ways. So one way is you might be much more likely to trust Google than some new startup that you've never heard of. And so you might be more likely to give an old established large company, large brand data about yourself than a startup. That's, uh, in addition to that, what this particular paper is about is another idea, which is that if you touch a company in lots of different places, or in particular a company touches you in a lot of different places, that uh, means that one opt-out can help that company in lots of different ways. And so if you're a startup or a smaller company that really is only doing one particular product, they have to pay effectively the same regulatory cost to get you to consent as a very large company. And that can create an opportunity um, and essentially benefit incumbents relative to entrance, benefit large companies at the expense of small. So if privacy, uh, if the so empirical and theoretical uh, structures that we have suggest privacy is going to hurt innovation and it might hurt competition, well, why are we talking about this at all? And the reason is that consumers actually do care about privacy. So this was a debate we've heard. Um, Yes, consumers aren't opting out of these things, but when we fix a particular context, we see more privacy protective behavior today than we used to. So it's much harder to get people to fill out surveys than it used to be. The census has to work harder to get people to fill out the census or you know, uh, information. It, given a context for communicating data, or uh, when we fix that, we're even more privacy sensitive than we used to be. What's changed, and the reason why we had the discussion, um, or at least I think the reason why we had that discussion in the previous panel on, yeah, but consumers don't seem to be doing anything about it, is because uh, along with more privacy concern has come with huge benefits to data sharing. And so you know, even if the costs are increasing or the perceived costs of sharing data are increasing, the perceived benefits, the ability to have Facebook and Google, et cetera, has grown as well. And so the... The, the point is, there's a trade-off between privacy and innovation. In lots of cases, there's a trade-off between privacy and competition. 
But that doesn't mean that privacy is bad. It just means that we need to recognize a, you know, these as distinct values, and there, we need to think about weighing them against each other. So the policy issue, so the theoretical policy issue is essentially privacy regulation can't be too strict, because if it's strict, it'll stifle data-driven innovation and competition. Right? If, if you don't allow firms to use data, they can't use data. And if data enables competition, as uh, we heard earlier today, um, or as I just described, or if data enables innovation, it's the, maybe the core input into a lot of the most exciting technologies today, artificial intelligence, um, uh, ad exchanges, et cetera, um, then data, you know, then privacy regulation would be too strict. It, or strict privacy regulation would hurt innovation, hurt competition. That said, we gotta remember, privacy regulation can't be too lax either. If it's so lax that consumers um, don't trust companies, then the companies won't get the data either. In Europe and the United States, at least the empirical evidence so far is we're a long way away from that. It's not clear if we are worldwide. So getting the balance right is the key challenge here. And given the importance of data to innovation, and AI in particular, privacy policy is one important way the regulatory environment is going to affect the rate and direction of innovation and the degree to which um, competition plays out. With that, Anya. Thank you. So I'm going to build directly on what Avi just said and uh, start with a particular setting, which is financial services. And so you can well imagine that in financial services, personal finance, consumers, we all worry a lot about privacy and security. Um, and uh, that is a particular setting I studied um, together with my co-author in, um, at the introduction of a, at the time, quite new technological service, which in the early 2000s was online banking. And the question is, how do you actually want to start sharing information with consumers, protect consumers' privacy and security? Now, nowadays, online banking is something we are used to on an everyday uh, basis. In the early 2000s, it was not very much spread, but I think there are lessons that we can learn for the use of new technologies in uh, today and in the future. Um, what is the underlying trade-off? Well, um, of course, especially in this type of setting, consumers care about privacy and security verification hurdles to prevent others, third parties, to access their financial information and potentially execute transactions such as money transfers in these consumers' names. But the other point is that consumers, and Avi briefly alluded to that, also care very much about ease of use or else they may not adopt the new technological service, right? And so um, this is ultimately the trade-off we, we worry about a lot when we speak about privacy and technology adoption. And the question is, what are actually the implications? Now, in that particular study, in that particular empirical setting, what we observe is that because of privacy and security concerns, the uh, bank implemented multiple hurdles for a consumer to use the service, starting with a requiring a paper-based sign-up, then sending to the consumer login information that allows the consumer to use the service in terms of gathering information, but not actually executing transaction, to do the latter, an additional piece of information, transaction numbers were required. And um, so if we, what we have ultimately in, in this type of setting, and more generally, is a multi-stage adoption process where the consumer goes through the hurdles of signing up, logging in, doing a transaction, and potentially substantive over time repeat usage. Um, given these hurdles that were implemented in order to protect consumer privacy and security, what we have here is that actually um, since uh, the consumer had to go through all these steps, this introduced substantial delays in the process. Right? And what we find is that uh, delays that come here through this process through exogenous shifters actually reduces at any point in time the probability a consumer would go to the next stage, say from logging in, actually doing a first transaction. <laughs> 
And these effects are sig significant. So for example, more than a third of consumers would not log in in the month of sign up. About a third of consumers would not actually do initiated transaction in the month of their first login. And so you can see what the knock-on effect of those are, both for consumers who now do not use a service that is intended to you know, make their life easier perhaps, or have a, uh, be more efficient in actually handling and transferring in their money, keeping a certain balance in their banking accounts. And on the other hand, for firms who still needed to deal a lot more with paper-based transactions. And so um, to wrap this uh, short uh, uh, summary up, the, uh, the key insight here is that, well, complex security protocols that we might want to set up to ensure privacy and security of very personal important pieces of information um, might, on the other hand, actually reduce adoption. And to the extent that we think that adoption of new technologies and innovations are good for consumers and maybe for the economy more broadly, that raises the question about where the balance would be and what could be done to um, eliminate these frustrations by consumers while at the same point in time encouraging adoptions. Um, and so the, uh, the, the, the key point, therefore, is whether efforts that we have to ensure online data security and the privacy can therefore have and how they can have unintended consequences for the diffusion of uh, new innovative services. And I think any discussion of uh, these questions uh, will need to consider such unintended consequences. Thank you. Great. Um, so what I'd like to do um, with uh, these remarks is to talk a little bit about some empirical research uh, that I've done focusing on the area of health privacy and looking at the effects of different privacy regulation um, related to healthcare data. And I focus on health in my research, um, health privacy in particular, because health is an area where we have sensitive information, the privacy issues can be really important, the data can be persistent, um, and also it's an area where in the United States there's been the most regulatory activity um, on the part of states. Uh, so the first uh, paper I want to talk about uh, looked at the effect of uh, regulation that was targeted targeting one aspect of data privacy, which is data security. Um, it's about controlling information and making sure it's not being used uh, in ways that are not intended. And specifically, what we did was we looked at what happens when states pass laws um, that were encouraging data security practices, and they were trying to encourage firms um, to use, to adopt encryption technology and encrypt their data. Uh, what we found is that when states had these encryption exemptions in their data um, privacy rules that basically promoted encryption, we find that more hospitals adopted encryption and data loss went up. Why is that? Human error. So what happened was the, the policy was pushing a technology. Um, people resp firms responded by adopting the technology, but it didn't achieve the policy goal. Um, and I think that the, uh, the theme there that I want to kind of draw out from this, um, from this research that I'll come to again is that when we think about designing our policies, we want to think about the goal and we want to think about the details of how we get there. And so focusing on a particular technology, especially in a sphere where technology is evolving, um, can often lead to weaker offense effects than we expect or even reverse or perverse effects. Um, that theme is going to come up in the second um, paper I want to tell you about, which was a paper that looked at um, the efforts, uh, some policy efforts that were made to encourage the adoption um, of health IT as part of the High Tech Act. And specifically, the goal, one of the goals was to try to encourage hospitals to exchange health information about patients. Um, the policy lever that was applied in trying to achieve this goal was promoting a technological capacity on the part of hospitals. So they had to show that they had the technology to be able to share data and to exchange data and that it could be interoperable with other systems. Um, what, we find, um, so foc what we find in our research is that the focus on technology, again, was not sufficient. Um, we find in our research that hospitals that were part of big hospital systems with lots of hospitals in them were actually more likely to exchange data with other hospitals. They were more likely to have the capacity to exchange data. Uh, but they exchanged data internally with other hospitals in their system. What they didn't do or what they were much less likely to do was to share data outside of their system. Okay, and so the reason for that is, um, is that they didn't necessarily have a business incentive to want to share the data. 
right? The hospital is producing this information. They are creating medical records. Um, they're collecting information. They're storing it. Um, and they are not necessarily going to want to give it away freely to their competitors, to other hospitals in their local area, even if there is a policy benefit um, or a public benefit for that. And so what we have is this creation of information silos um, by focusing on technology um, we didn't prevent that. So this echoes, again, the first theme about thinking about how we design our specific interventions and how that's important. The second theme, I think, is even broader, um, which is it relates to this question of how do we think about data, health data about individuals, but actually consumer data or individual data more broadly. Okay, and this question um, about ownership, I think, is, is a little bit new and special here. Um, the fact is that companies or businesses or organizations are creating data. They're collecting data. It's their data. They might think they own it, but it's data about people. And so people might think that they have some ownership. And it's actually ambiguous who should own the data and even who does own the data. And I think this ambiguity about property rights and about even what there should be um, is an area of concern and an area that leads, I think, to some potential inefficiencies. It also means that when we think about privacy policy, there's not a clear binary on-off of do we protect privacy or not, um, but there's, or how much do we protect along a single linear dimension, but there's questions about what aspect of privacy are we targeting. Um, are we talking about the ability to collect it, to store it, to exchange it, or to use it? Um, are we talking about users' rights to access their own information? Um, so the third paper that I want to tell you about, this uh, third research paper also in healthcare, um, looks at variation in policies, in privacy policies that actually took different approaches, all to address the same common issue of genetic privacy. So different states took different approaches to um, protecting genetic information, and what we look at in our, in our research is how these different approaches affect the rates at which individuals were willing to get genetic tests um, to predict their cancer risk. So this can be very sensitive information. You think privacy, privacy protection could be important. What we find here is that the type of the protection actually makes a big difference, and that the different forms of protection had completely different effects. So a policy approach that focused on informed consent and letting individuals know about exactly who had the property rights um, and how that information was going to be used and, and, uh, and about their privacy concerns actually had a significant effect of lowering rates of testing. Um, when uh, the privacy laws instead emphasized um, or required um, a um um, a required permission from consumers for the, their own data to be redisclosed or sent to a third party, so gave the, the individual more ownership, um, that actually promoted adoption. A third approach that's actually the most common approach used in privacy protection for genetic um, information is a focus on how the data can be used. Um, and so rules like that that limit the ability of employers or insurers to use genetic information in terms of pricing or market interactions actually had no effect on adoption. So these anti-discrimination laws that focus on the use of data um, were not effective. Uh, there are vi various reasons for these effects, and I, maybe we'll have time to talk about more in the Q&A. Um, but I'm running out of time, so I want to say um, that, um, that, right, so that this, um, again, I think, highlights this, this theme earlier about the details of the policy making a big difference. And even policies that almost sound like they're the same thing, a genetic privacy law, can actually have opposite effects depending on the particulars of how it's specified. Okay, so to summarize, I want to just relate this to the two topics of the, of the panel. First of all, as we relate to competition policy, I think the research we found with the creation of data silos in big hospital systems emphasizes the important concerns that we should have about um, big data and the potential to lock in consumers um, and how this does create potentially a competitive advantage for bigger firms um, and make it harder for incumbents, um, sorry, make it harder for entrants and small firms to compete, and it relates to the exchange of information. Second point is that when we think about innovation policy, all of these papers um, that I've talked about and some that I haven't had a chance to talk about but that Avi and Anya have talked about, I think all show that there is a real connection between privacy regulation and future innovation. Um, and in many ways, privacy policy is innovation policy um, in healthcare and, and elsewhere. Thank you. Great, hi, thanks. Um, so uh, 
I titled this Confessions of a Convert, uh, and I'll explain that, which is that uh, I've been writing about privacy for 16 years and uh, often find myself at conferences of privacy law scholars, all of who favor much more aggressive privacy regulation, and I've been one of the few people to say, oh, let's, let's apply the brakes, let's think about the trade-offs involved. Um, so I'll talk you through about a, a decade's worth of research and how I got to where I am now. So uh, exactly a decade ago, I started thinking about ways in which uh, the proliferation of reputation information about individuals was providing all kinds of opportunities for law and legal systems. Uh, Yelp and uh, regulation of the medical profession by the AMA are substitutes for one another. And in a lot of respects, the kinds of um, information that's generated by services like Yelp or TripAdvisor provides a really nice substitute for government inspectors and those sorts of mechanisms of making sure that consumers are getting their money's worth and that firms are behaving appropriately. Uh, about a half decade ago, I started thinking about the political economy of privacy, why why differences arise, especially between the United States and Europe, which have only become uh, more pronounced since then, and tried to emphasize that privacy regulations create uh, winners uh, and losers, uh, and that we can predict who they'll be, that sometimes the impacts of privacy regulations are often regressive. And then just a couple of years ago, uh, I started to think empirically about research. Uh, this is actually a 2016 paper, um, rather than a 2014 one. But in any event, uh, what we tried to do was make some progress on one of the chief topics for this panel today, which is to figure out, well, why aren't markets developing? We spent a lot of time looking at the use of um, automated content analysis of consumers' emails for the purposes of serving them with personalized advertisements. We asked consumers, a, um, a nationally representative sample of them, uh, how invasive do you regard these sorts of practices where Gmail is looking at the contents of your emails and giving you personalized ads? And they said, quite invasive. Uh, 7.63 was the mean response on a scale of 1 to 10. And uh, at the same time, we said, well, would you be willing to pay any amount of money to avoid it? Uh, no, uh, was the response of about two-thirds of the sample. Uh, and that's another example of the privacy paradox that's been uh, mentioned in some of the other uh, research. Uh, among those who were willing to pay, the median willingness to pay uh, stated in surveys, so not a revealed preference, was just $15 per year, and looking at how much consumers said this data was worth to them versus how much we know it's worth to Google or Facebook or Yahoo, um, uh, we think that probably those platforms uh, value it more than the individual consumers do, at least with respect to personalized ads based on email content. So um, that's sort of what I've been working on uh, and how I arrived here. Uh, today, and I do uh, want to stick by um, some earlier views that I've articulated, which is that there's still lots of reason to think that the U.S. has done quite well by having a relatively permissive environment, that we've seen a lot of innovation, that there are technologies that have developed in the United States that couldn't have developed in Europe because people would have needed permission to, do the, to develop the kinds of applications that have proved to be so successful both here and uh, there. But at the same time, there seem to be real breakdowns in the, the self-regulatory model in the laissez-faire approach. Uh, one of these breakdowns is that um, uh, consumers often don't know about all the problems that can arise, whether it's on a data security side or on a privacy side. With robust journalistic efforts, with robust enforcement by the FTC, consumers can find out and make informed decisions. Uh, it's not clear that adequate resources are being developed to identify privacy snafus or data security snafus um, by either of those institutions. And the proof is in the pudding uh, to some extent, which is to say that um, uh, if you ask Americans, as Reuters uh, did a few months ago, whether they trust Facebook to obey the laws that protect their personal info, it, it protect their personal info, the majority will say, no, we don't trust Facebook, even though Facebook has a very, very strong financial incentive in getting people to yes on that question. And some of the other technology companies with probably better records um, generate majorities saying that we trust you, but not uh, anywhere near super majorities. Um, okay, so as we think about privacy from where we are in 2018, uh, I think we can talk about some of the fundamental ways in which uh, the world's looking worse for privacy and the laissez-faire approach than it was 10 years ago. Um, uh, Jane talked about uh, Cambridge Analytica. Hopefully, we'll be able to talk about that during, uh, during the Q&A. Um, I probably think there are uh, things we can all agree about that Cambridge Analytica did wrong, uh, 
um, most prominently, um, I should have the right to reveal or not reveal personal information about myself, and I didn't choose to delegate that to the 800 friends I have on Facebook. And when Facebook uh, organized their APIs such that any of 800 people could choose to reveal a lot of information about me that was potentially sensitive, that strikes me as a technological breakdown, one that potentially lends itself to um, regulation. Uh, we're seeing, especially in the last election cycle, in the last couple of years, doxing, instances of online harassment, online trolling uh, that's really off the charts. And I think it's scaring off the sensible center from a lot of political discourse, it's scaring off women, scaring off people of color, uh, really uh, compromising fundamental values that uh, are bedrocks of American and democratic societies more generally. Think about how often you answer your cell phone now versus how often, if it's an unrecognized number, you just let it ring and go to voicemail. Lots and lots of people, um, as a result of breakdowns in do not call um, and flagrant violations of do not call, uh, lots of people have stopped answering phones. Uh, and think about the costs of that. Those costs are real, and they're felt by consumers, they're felt by f uh, people trying to make phone calls. Uh, and we can look overseas and see some of the things that's happening with social credit scoring uh, in China, uh, and be really worried about uh, some of the potential for abuses of these kinds of technologies. So just in the minute I've got left, let me um, identify uh, a couple of issues. The first, which I think we'll talk about on the next panel, uh, is there's lots of inconsistencies between GDPR and the American approach. The world is going with the European approach, not with the American approach. That makes, uh, that causes real problems for American companies uh, and for the free flow of data across the Atlantic, across the Pacific, between uh, North America and Latin America. Um, so uh, one idea that harkens back to work by Victor Mayer Schoenenberg, um, Schoenenberger in his 2009 uh, book, Delete, which formed the basis for the European right to be forgotten, um, turns out, I think, to have some modern uh, adaptations, which is um, uh, here's a proposal uh, for deletion by default. Okay. Uh, the, the main problem with the right to be forgotten is currently implemented by the European Union is that it's unconstitutional under First Amendment law. Um, there are ways to accomplish the same kinds of objectives without running aground of any constitutional problems. And deletion by default, which is certain data, should automatically be deleted by, uh, let's say, 10 years after it's collected, purchase history information, Facebook posts, et cetera. And people could always choose to opt out of that, which is, I think, both um, constitutionally permissible under the US regime and also uh, probably better. So Google puts out really useful data about how often people are actually exercising the right to be forgotten. And it turns out that the rate of utilization is about 0.15% of European residents have exercised their rights under the right to be forgotten under a generous interpretation of data from the Google Transparency Report. So as we think about, well, what are the kinds of purposes that are vindicated by the right to be forgotten? Uh, the right to be forgotten as employed, which puts the onus on the consumer to delete information, isn't working. Something like deletion by default uh, would work much better, and it's an approach worth considering. Thanks. Mr. Talang, oh, um, who, who is oh. not Lior Strahilovitz, no. but, uh, uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to be quick so that we have opportunities for, uh, for others to chime in as well. Uh, my name is Rahul Chilang. I'm a professor at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, I'll pick up from where Lior left. I'm not as pessimistic, I think, as maybe he is about the power of uh, markets and competition in, 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 uh, in, in solving some of the problems. Uh, but but let me uh, let me just highlight and 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 maybe we all agree with this. Uh, but but in an ideal world, really, what we want to know is where exactly is the friction. Rather than thinking about what regulations will work, we want to probably sit back and ask what exactly is the friction that people face when they're dealing with the customer data or our own data uh, and, and firms are utilizing that uh, information. You know, think of that as essentially an externality problem, that firm has my data, they are somehow misusing it or extracting too much rents out of it than I would like them to do it, and that's the externality they're imposing on me. And, and the question is that how can we push that externality back onto the firms? Uh, maybe I'm misquoting, but, 
you know, the, generally the, the FTC has looked at this as, as a problem of can we make information available to consumers so they can make better informed decisions, more or less without imposing too much of regulation, and I think that's what, uh, uh, you know, uh, Lior also sort of mentioned. Um, and I'll come back and talk a little bit about where we stand. Um, but then the idea is that, well, this should lead to, you know, across the board innovation, both at the demand side and actually at the supply side, right? I mean, if you want a whole lot of privacy, then there should be some firms available who are willing to provide that privacy. Maybe not at the firm level, but maybe at the intermediary level. Maybe you will use, you know, certain browser with certain features in it that will make sure that Facebook might or might not be able to collect your data. Maybe you're not able to do it, but at some level the idea is that both that there is going to be a demand for privacy, security, whatever you want to name it, uh, but then also there is a potential possibility of, uh, of supply for uh, privacy and security. And, you know, I guess the question, maybe, maybe some of us believe that this model can never work. Maybe some of uh, us might believe that at least partially this model can work. I mean, fundamentally, this problem maybe just come down to whether security and privacy can be a feature that the firm can advertise. And it doesn't have to be that whether we are willing to pay for it monetarily. There are some other ways people are willing to pay, including market share, uh, transactions, uh, how, how long we want to be, uh, have relationship with the firm, so on and so forth, or whether it is just a bug that we are worried about and then everybody is trying to figure out a way to undermine that. Um, in some aspect, the evidence is not completely negative. I mean, in fact, if you think about it, you know, maybe the data breach notification law would be a good example where, you know, it forced fair amount of disclosure, at least on the parts of the firm. And if you look at it, um, we are holding a lot of firms actually accountable. Even if not the firms directly, we do punish the executives. I mean, Equifax CEO had to resign because there was a data breach. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg did have to come in front of the Congress and actually provide some details and, you know, at least some embarrassment uh, Wall Street Journal reporting and, and New York Times Press, which probably none of them they would like. So, so there is a little bit of externality that we are pushing back on the firm without any you know, serious regulation on what you can do with uh, my data or what you cannot do with the data, but at least in terms of making it clear to people that, look, they, these people might or might not be abusing our data. And there is really no impact, uh, no way for us to empirically measure whether things have gotten worse or better, uh, but there is at least some evidence that maybe firms are being elastic to some of those changes in terms of how they are uh, storing our data, uh, how they are sharing our data, so on and so forth. Um, I think, you know, one other point is that sometimes we talk about, you know, when we're designing policy, can you share the data? Uh, should we stop the data uh, uh, sharing between firms or data abuse? I think at some level you could also think of maybe there is certain part of the data that is off, uh, you're off limits, and maybe there is some other part of the data it's perfectly satisfied, perfectly might satisfy the firm. So I mean, think about online advertisement. Sure, some, advert some targeting is very effective. We need some data for that targeting to be very effective, but maybe there is a whole lot of information that the firm uses is really not that effective. Or they can find proxy for that and be able to be reasonably effective without knowing my social security number or name or what have you, and some other, other proxies might work too. Uh, so, so it doesn't have to be always a, 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 a zero-sum game. Uh, one more point, and... and, and, and how does, ah, okay. Uh, one more point I wanted to highlight is that it's also we have to remember sometimes that sometimes is the, the uncertainty in regulation that actually can hurt innovation more than the regulation itself sometimes. Uh, again, if you go back, when the data breach notification loss came, everybody complained about it. So much compliance is happening. So much compliance costs are happening. I don't think anybody complains about it. In fact, firm says, you know, instead of 50 different states, I would rather have one national law so that, you know, I can kind of get over with the, some of the, uh, or lower my compliance costs. Nobody's saying that we shouldn't be having those laws. And in fact, if you think about it, there are second order and third order benefits to sometimes these regulations. For example, if you talk to cyber insurance policymakers, they will 
everybody would agree that actually the data breach notification laws uh, led to so much cyber policy being written to provide insurance against data breaches because some of those regulations actually provided some certainty about what the cost would be, what the, what the floor would be, what the ceiling would be, uh, and that led to you know, some of the significant growth in cyber insurance, which also then creates uh, good practices and what have you. So there are all these secondary and tertiary benefits sometimes with, with, with regulations. Uh, uh, you know, lack of un uh, uncertainty can help. There's a lot of work, not just in the privacy space, but automobile space, health space, uh, environment protection space, which seems to argue that if you reduce some uncertainty and stop sending unclear signals to the industry, actually it can be very helpful. Again, go back. Automobile industry bitterly uh, opposed the seat belt and the airbag. And once those regulations actually came in, they figured out a way to actually live with that, not only live with that, actually innovate where all of us benefited, the consumers as a safety, but they also were able to sell it as a feature where they were able to actually price them out. So something to think about where we think about regulation uh, that, that sometimes having some certainty can be actually much more useful uh, than, than, than sometimes just arguing about what the regulation and the content of the regulation should be. So I'll stop here. Okay, terrific. Um, I, I guess I, I'd like to um, start really with a question for the entire panel. Um, we've had, um, and. I'm sort of reminded we've had some really excellent research-based panels. We are uh, a research-based agency. We do research-based law enforcement on both the competition and the consumer protection side. We do research-based policy work. But I'm thinking of various threads that have um, come up over the two days that have reminded me of, a, of, of, of an outdated and terribly un fair label for economics is the dismal science. Um, so, um, so what do I have in mind here? There's quite a, a bit of research on certainly um, market imperfections, whether or not they're durable market failures, people might debate. So uh, very high information costs, very high um, uh, maybe information asymmetries uh, when it comes to privacy issues, both between uh, uh, firms and, and consumers, folks like like we're sitting up here, uh, and in, indeed between uh, uh, firms as vendors and, and firms as consumers. Uh, certainly there's evidence of, of people suffering very, this kinds of information privacy re related harms ranging from identity theft to any manner of other things. Um, we've had some very interesting and I think useful and important research on um, uh, some of the um, uh, limits of uh, intervention in this space, right? So um, uh, first, uh, competition issues surrounding uh, privacy interventions, which may uh, not always, but may tend to favor uh, large uh, firms and incumbent firms at the expense of uh, uh, smaller firms or entrants. Um, uh, uh, certainly um, uh, unanticipated effects uh, from privacy regulations, which sometimes um, just, I'm thinking of some of Professor Miller's research, say, say with Catherine Tucker, just um, uh, health effects that weren't anticipated with HIIT uh, regulations, one thing, or even, you know, you, you get, you flip the sign of your anticipated effect is with, with some of the data security regulations. It doesn't mean that all data security regulations will have these effects, but it's, it's certainly not a, a, a positive result. And um, so I guess one thing is, is sort of just a question go down the line. It seems that there is maybe some pertinent research, but quite a bit less that answers the policy question, um, uh, what do consumers win with one or another uh, privacy or data regulation intervention? Plainly, consumers have concerns in this space. I don't think anybody would deny that, but one, <laughs> One question is, do we have an adequate research basis for saying, first of all, that these interventions will actually be effective, whether in one silo or another or across uh, large sectors of the economy? Um, and second, you know, an adequate way of assessing uh, consumer benefits, right? So we have, we have costs when we fail <laughs> to intervene. We have costs when we intervene. Um, have we developed a good science of assessing 
and then actually achieving concrete benefits. We're just going to go. Any, anyone? Yeah, we'll go down this way unless someone <laughs> wants to pass. So, uh, so I agree that we, we have very, very good research on narrow, on, on some narrow questions. Uh, I, can, I continue, though, to, um, to, I mean, I'm basically restating what my opening comments were, that I, I continue to be concerned that we haven't even really defined the harms in order, well enough to then know how to measure them. And, and that, that's, actually, that's, that's really a, a sort of more of a philosophical question than, than even a, an empirical one. Uh, and so if, without it, though, the foundation for doing the empirical research that we would need to do is, is, is lacking. Uh, so, uh, so, so, yeah, I, I'm concerned that we don't have enough uh, of an evidence base quite yet. Um, so if we weren't the discipline, we're looking for some kind of Pareto optimal Pareto optimal solution where everyone, there's a market failure where everyone would be better off uh, because we have a regulation. And, the, and that's, it doesn't happen that often. Maybe credit scoring and uh, the Fair Credit Reporting Act was a privacy regulation that was Pareto improving, but, uh, and in some sense we've been looking for that in the privacy space for 20 years. It's, it's not obvious that such a thing happens. It seems pretty clear that the empirical work says there's a trade-off. There's a trade-off between, you know, uh, more privacy might mean less innovation, it might mean less competition, um, I have some other work that suggests it might mean more inequality, but that doesn't mean that it's, it's a bad thing. We've also heard a whole bunch of reasons why privacy is good. And so, um, you know, and, and you said, you know, it's, this regulation is not effective. In some sense, a lot of the regulations have been extraordinarily effective. If the goal was to restrict pri uh, data flows, the regulations restrict data flows. They do exactly what they were supposed to do. <laughs> that just means that, um, you know, ads become less effective or um, healthcare doesn't work as well. But um, let's, you know, they are effective in, a, it, in terms of their explicit goals on you know, restricting data flows. So I just think it's important to realize there's trade-offs here. These are hard decisions. And in some sense, the empirical work, like as an economist, I don't, I, certainly I don't feel like I have the skills to tell you about those trade-offs. What I can say is what those, you know, I can really lay out well is what those trade-offs are. Okay, so um, two points on that. I think one interesting point is that uh, the perception of privacy changes. You know, what we regard today as privacy relevant and what was regarded 20 or 50 years ago as privacy relevant or sensitive information may not be regarded as such anymore today, or at least not all of it. And if I look at my younger students, they might still have a different perception of which data are you know, privacy sensitive than I have. So I think one aspect is that these, sens these sensitivities and they the tra therefore the trade-offs also change over time. Um, and I think this is just one point to keep in the back of our mind as we are trying to uh, think about policies. Mm -hmm. The second point is that uh, I do believe that these trade-offs are highly context dependent. Um, and the harms and the benefits are very context dependent. And you know, similar to what Avi said, I um, think it is very hard to lay out the overall overarching framework for how these trade-offs should be solved. So think, for example, a retailer that uh, holds information about your browsing behavior. We had the um, example of Target earlier, but think about this happening online. And uh, uses it in a way that uh, one consumer feels is privacy invasive. On the other hand, the retailer might also use that information to structure information um, uh, displayed on in response to product searches on their website, which may have to, uh, for consequence, the consumer gets a better selection of product, a better choice, makes a better choice, and makes, spends less time on making those choices. And so this is what I mean with context dependent. There are settings where the harms may more obviously, um, or the, the benefits may more obviously outweigh the harms, and maybe set, uh, other settings where the harms may uh, play out in very different ways, way outside the specific context, as for example, in online advertising. Uh, okay, so uh, I think these are the tough questions. Um, a few thoughts. One, one thing um, in thinking about the costs and benefits of privacy protection, I think it's always helpful for me to step back and think about the costs and benefits of privacy itself and then think about the privacy regulation. Um, I think that 
you know, some of the results that, that I found uh, that we find of privacy regulation leading to less adoption of technology could actually reflect an underlying latent um, benefit or need for that regulation. So to the extent that, that informing consumers about privacy risks makes them less likely to do something um, that entails a privacy risk, it's not obvious that that's inefficient. It could be that they were inefficiently um, you know, under, uh, unaware of, of privacy risks or that it wasn't salient to them. Um, and so I think that there's sort of a question of um, you know, how much are we um, so there's a question, there's trade-offs in, involved in the privacy policy, and I think also the point Avi made earlier is important that, that no privacy protection is, um, is also going to be a problem. So when we think about the costs and benefits of privacy protection policy, one of the big costs we want to think about from not protecting privacy is all of the privacy protecting in, in, um, uh, activities that individuals will engage in. Um, in the absence of regulation that protects them. So if they don't feel that their data are safe, they may not download apps on their phone. They may not do different kinds of things. They may, you know, shut off Facebook or never post pictures of their child online um, because they don't feel that, that's that that privacy is protected. And so we think about those potential benefits from privacy protection. We want to take those into account. At the same time, um, you know, my own research and other research by others does show that sometimes regulation well-intended um, can have real harms um, in terms of slowing the diffusion of technologies. I didn't talk about this paper, but this um, other research I did with Catherine Tucker looked at privacy laws um, protecting health privacy led to less adoption of electronic medical records in U.S. hospitals. And then we show in, in another paper that this actually, um, um, this slower adoption um, led to uh, greater mortality, greater infant mortality, um, because this technology itself was saving infants' lives. And so there are, you know, real substantial costs to um, not protecting privacy, but also to not having these technological innovations in healthcare um, and other spheres. I just um, kind of want to give some, some another point about just the very pessimistic results that, that I have about, I think the trade-offs are real, um, and I think they're important to consider, but I don't want the message to be, um, so I, th I think the message should be that we should be cautious and the details matter and it's, there are a lot of ways we can go wrong. Um, but I don't want the message to be that, that that's an excuse for inaction or for just throwing our hands up and not trying. Um, I think what it means is that we should have modest um, expectations. We should put in some effort before we make rules and to try to look at the research, try to experiment, try to try things on a smaller scale, uh, maybe where the impact um, is not going to be um, so bad if we get it wrong, um, and try things. And then, you know, uh, be flexible. If we have a policy, let's monitor and let's see if it's working or if it's not working, and if it isn't, let's change it. Um, so I don't think that it's something that we sit down and, you know, in a room devise the optimal solution, you know, QED X star, and we just go with that. I think we just want to um, be aware of the issues and then actively, continuously um, try to work on that. Um, I think I agree with what's been said. It's hard to do cost-benefit analysis for privacy because privacy harms are and always have been hard to quantify. Okay, so let's start with that. Um, but that doesn't mean that when we're trying to do something like cost-benefit analysis, we have to throw our hands up in the air. So one thing that you can try and do is look around you and think about whether the ways in which the legal system deals with privacy are typical or exceptional. And so I want to provide two lenses from doing that. One way you can do that is by looking at how privacy gets treated versus how other kinds of big goofs get treated. All right, so one thing that's really unusual about the way that privacy is regulated by the Federal Trade Commission is that the Federal Trade Commission does not start out with finding authority for big privacy goofs. And so when I explain to lay people that it's only because Facebook had previously entered into a consent decree with the FTC that the FTC has the ability to impose monetary fines as a result of Cambridge Analytica, they're very <coughs> surprised by that. You're probably not surprised by that, but people you talk to who are not lawyers, regulators, policy people are probably extremely surprised. And indeed, that makes the United States exceptional when compared to the way that other companies deal with privacy, uh, or sorry, other countries deal with privacy, and also other parts of the U.S. Uh, regulatory system deal with big goofs, right? So when Ford Pintos started exploding, right, because of faulty gas tanks, we didn't say, okay, Ford, 
you know, if you make another car that start exploding, that starts exploding, we will fine you for that. But you know, you get one free goof. This was a badly designed <coughs> car. You're off the hook, right? We kind of have that response with respect to privacy, at least from a federal regulatory perspective. There's other things that will happen, like class action lawsuits that Facebook will be dealing with. They'll lose some consumers. I'm not suggesting that they face no repercussions, but it is a little bit unusual that how we treat privacy vis-a-vis -vis other kinds of products and how we treat, or other kinds of interests, and how the U.S. treats privacy versus the way the rest of the um, developed world treats privacy. And I think that can be informative in terms of how we should think about what the right approach is. Is there a generic takeaway that's really hard to say anything simply because? <coughs> Uh, if is there a generic takeaway that we can take, uh, you know, from from all the research and, and a meta research? It's it's hard because it's a very heterogeneous problem. I think one thing that I feel we can take away is that you know consumers are really good at compartmentalizing. That they they, for us the transaction costs are very high. Even reading one line every time we transact with a with a website is just too costly for us. However. Um, uh, you know, th there's uh, some research that I'm I'm working on, uh, and one of the one of the, the one of the challenge of privacy research at some level is that if you go survey based, then you're always you know overestimating everything because if you ask people, then I think people have already in the last panel talked about the, the variance between survey and behavior is so large that it, you wonder what you can glean. Plus, there is a long term issue too. But anyway, we are actually working with the actual transaction. We are working with a very large bank um, which has very detailed information uh, on how people transact. And one of the things that we clearly notice that people care if something goes wrong with their financial, that is, if something goes wrong with their, with the credit card, with their bank, with something that has direct money involved, they are a lot more careful. They are a lot more willing to punish the firm if it's going to have, uh, if, if a fraud is going to happen on your bank or your credit card account, and we can see that in the data. On the other hand, if Home Depot uses, uh, loses your data, or if Target loses your data, we are a lot less willing to punish them. Our transaction behavior doesn't change a whole lot, maybe because we think that, well, Lowe's isn't going to be any better. Maybe we think that the financial cost is really not very high. The credit card is going to pick it up. I'll get a new credit card. I really don't want to kind of go through all the hassle. So, I feel like it's very context dependent. If I feel that I'm going to incur a significant financial harm, I think people really take action. And if they feel that, well, the financial harm is secondary, tertiary, might happen sometimes in the future, might not happen at all, uh, I think they tend to kind of ignore many of the, you know, the privacy red lights, if you would, uh, in, in that regard. I just wanted to add one thing. Uh, I, I think it might be useful to, to distinguish the intrinsic value of privacy that that um, that people might want control over the access to their data and the, and the ultimate use of their data uh, from the downstream harms that privacy might protect. And, and I find that if we identify the downstream harms, then we can try to measure them. That, that gives us a lot better of a chance, I think, to do this trade-off. But th with the intrinsic value of privacy, uh, you know, I, I, like, I don't quite know what a privacy goof, for example, is. I know that when a Pinto explodes, nobody wants to be in that Pinto, but I, <laughs> but and everyone, everyone basically ascribes roughly the same value to, you know, to their health and, and life and, and also their, their money. But, um, but the intrinsic value of privacy is not clear to me. And I think Jinjo Jin mentioned yesterday that a problem in this area is that preferences, to the extent they can be measured at all, are, are widely varying, they're time dependent, they're, they're dependent on so many things that I don't even know if it's useful to, to think about intrinsic va values and maybe we should just be looking at the downstream. So um, <clears throat> thank you. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I'm interested in the conditions under which someone does want to be in a Pinto. Um, <laughs> but. Um, so, you know, we've heard a lot, I think, here about context, and maybe it's not surprising that people have done very uh, fruitful research in specific contexts, specific industries, specific technologies, um, right, whether we're talking about finance, consumer credit, uh, healthcare, different research on healthcare systems adoption uh, versus uh, other issues in healthcare. I mean, maybe in some ways, I mean, to pick up on, 
uh, something that was mentioned about FTC. This is, this is convenient for the FTC's approach uh, to privacy, both on the competition side and the consumer protection side, right? We look at um, transactions, at mergers that may um, unduly burden competition and do harm to consumers. We have a framework uh, for doing that, whether in the information economy or elsewhere, on the um, uh, consumer protection side with uh, privacy and data security and enforcement, we uh, look for harms, right, specific harms cognizable uh, under the FTC Act or under special statutes uh, and evidence for concrete harms in concrete contexts um, and um, under unfairness harms that aren't offset, say, by countervailing uh, efficiencies, um, but I'm also wondering a little bit first, um, was mentioned, I think, by Professor Ostra Hilovitz, uh, can't see on there, maybe I've, I've just got it wrong, uh, uh, about our authority, and, well, maybe two of you, uh, conditions under which we can levy fines or pr pursue different remedies. So, so one question I would ask is, is simply, um, what adjustments might be recommended to our authority or not uh, to improve our ability to address context-specific uh, harms, whether on the competition side or on the consumer protection side. And, and then I guess second, sort of the what's left out, we don't do everything. Um, are we optimistic or pessimistic about extending some of this learning to calls for much more general overarching privacy regulation, whether we're talking about, you know, compare and contrast, say, uh, HIPAA with the GDPR uh, approach or, or um, you know, Fair Credit Reporting Act with the uh, GDPR approach, federal, state, industry, industry, or uh, overarching. Um, I guess both, the, the, so two, two hard questions, um, if we could just go down the uh, panel, and I guess, I, th th I think we've actually got eight minutes, but thank you. Uh, um, by the no. clock, we're scheduled to go to four. No? no? Okay. <laughs> That's what it says here. Okay. Uh, well, uh, sorry, if we could go briefly. Um, uh, <laughs> Okay, so I'll, um, I'll summarize. So FTC authority yeah. is one. Would you alter it based on any findings? Maybe, maybe that's enough. Um, I think this is not the real one. Okay. okay. I'll, I'll, I'll take a, a stab at it. Um, so I think one thing that would be really useful for the FTC to think about are what are the kinds of um, problems that the courts have a hard time remedying? And so, you know, a classic example is the, is the data breach, okay? So courts really struggle with data breaches for the following reason. Let's suppose a whole bunch of data is breached. Let's suppose that every American faces a baseline risk every year of 2%, 2% chance they'll be victimized by identity theft, okay? Now let's suppose that the people whose data was breached face a 3% chance of identity theft, okay? And let's say we're talking about tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people. We know that the breach was costly, very costly, we know that it elevated the risk for people in the, in the pool, relevant pool by 50%. But courts are going to be looking for proof that a particular individual suffered identity theft, the classic harm in a data breach, as a result of this particular breach. Okay? You'll want to, at least there's a circuit split in terms of dealing with these issues, but you'll want, in order to have an airtight uh, ability to get first standing and then establish the causal nexus, you're going to need to show a court that it's more probable than not that particular individuals suffered particular uh, out-of-pocket harms, pecuniary harms, as a result of a breach. And I think courts have a hard time with those kinds of cases. That's not the standard model of how a court proceeds. The standard model of how a court proceeds is show me in a civil suit that it's more probable than not that your injury resulted from their uh, mistake. Okay? So that's an area where we know statistically a lot of people are harmed, but we also know courts, Article III courts are going to really, really struggle with it, where I think there's a lot of room for the FTC to do really good work because the FTC can uh, litigate on and enforce on behalf of the aggregate, 
And it doesn't so much matter whether any individual happens to have been victimized because of the baseline risk of identity theft or because of the elevated risk resulting from a particular breach. And so I think that when the FTC thinks about its authority, it should think about, okay, what are class action lawyers doing and is any of that accomplishing any good? What is self-regulation doing and is any of that accomplishing any good? What are state attorneys general doing and is any of that accomplishing any good? Okay, what are the things that they're bad at? Odds are good that that's, that's, those are the things that the FTC can add the most value through. Thank you. Um, apparently, we're also bad at time management. Um, <laughs> so I uh, apologize for cutting the short. Thanks very much to uh, our panelists for uh, their contributions, and, and thanks for your attention. We uh, do not have a break here. We're going to shift right to uh, uh, Sorry? We have a five-minute break, so I'm wrong about that, too. Uh, and uh, five-minute break, but please come back uh, promptly. We've got a, a panel discussing uh, GDPR. Thanks uh, to our panelists. Yes, that break is not
Okay, hi everybody, it's four o'clock. That means it's time for the last panel of the day and this is the panel on the potential impact of GDPR on competition and innovation. Uh, my name is Hugh Stevenson from the Federal Trade Commission. Um, we just heard a general discussion about the effects of privacy re regulation on competition and innovation and in, in a sense this panel is, is now a kind of case study to look in more depth at that uh, general question. And here it's the, the effect of the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation that we've heard referred to a number of times throughout the, uh, the conference. Uh, this uh, regulation which uh, entered into force in May uh, of this year in the European Union. It's obviously still early days for GDPR, um, but we have a distinguished panel here lined up to talk about its uh, potential effects and the effects more generally, I would say, of the privacy approach uh, reflected in the EU. We, when we talk about the effects of GDPR, it's not just the effects of the new uh, regulation that came into effect uh, that added some new uh, features to what existed in Europe before, but also the European approach, which as we've heard varies in some significant ways from the American approach, and dating back at least uh, to the 95 data protection uh, directive. We have lots of panelists here and, and uh, little time, so I've asked uh, each speaker to give a, a, a few initial thoughts uh, before we proceed uh, to, to uh, questions. And we'll start uh, with uh, Renato Nazzini, who's a competition expert and a professor at King's College London. I turn the floor to him. Thank you very much, Hugh, and thank you very much for, for, for the invitation to, to be here. So in the, in the five minutes that I have, um, I, I, I would like to cover three points on the impact of European privacy regulation, which is you know, just recently the GDPR, but previously the, the privacy directive um, on, on competition. And I start with one first point. We, we heard a lot today about uh, the impact of privacy regulation on competition. And I think there is no doubt uh, in terms of the theoretical work that has been done and also the empirical work is there, in my view, that privacy regulation may have a negative impact on competition, may distort the competitive process by favoring or disproportionately certain players vis-a-vis -vis others. And there is also no doubt that there may be an impact on innovation and, and, and productivity uh, and so on. Now, the point I'd like to make is that the European approach is not really a choice between data protection regulation or no data protection regulation. Uh, data protection, the right to privacy and data protection is a constitutional uh, right, the right of a constitutional standing in the European Union, a fundamental right. So the point is which data protection regulation to achieve the, the desired outcome should we have? And, and I think that's really the important policy debate. We haven't had enough of it. We went straight into the GDPR, the privacy directive, and then the GDPR type or kind of process-based heavy um, uh, prescriptive uh, regulation we should have had, and we sh can still have um, uh, this debate now. Or, um, you know, there is never too late to change something that doesn't quite work. Um, as well, assuming that it doesn't. Uh, the second point um, uh, that I'd like to make is that, of course, there is also a lot of talk, and there has been a lot of talk about the GDPR, uh, about the role of uh, privacy regulation as an enabler of competition. And I, I'll give you the, the most important example, which is the right to portability in the GDPR. The right of the individual who provided the data to obtain this data, transfer them, or have them transferred to another supplier. Now, um, 
the point I'd like to make here is that uh, this portability right, which is there um, uh, or may be there also to address issues such as consumer switching in certain markets where data are important and there is a significant switching cost in, in the loss of data, uh, financial services, messaging apps, social networks, and, and so on and so forth, is not really a competition uh, uh, remedy. Mm, and it's not, therefore, going to be very effective, in my view, at addressing any competition concerns that we may have on these markets. And the key reason for that is that actually, together with switching costs and data, the other problem you have in these markets is consumer inertia. Uh, there, there, is, um, you know, there is quite a lot of research, and certainly even, even case law and, and commission practice in Europe uh, o, o, on this point. Uh, therefore, the right to portability, which depends entirely on the choice and the initiative of the consumer, is not really going to be very effective if we do not have a very well-informed and active consumer. I'd like to contrast it for, for just a moment with the open banking remedies in the UK. Um, open banking in the UK is a set of remedies uh, uh, which is there to address competition concerns in the retail banking sector. And one concern was uh, very uh, low levels of switching of consumers and actually small businesses as well. And the remedy there imposed on certain uh, UK banks is a, 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 a relates to actually um, uh, the, the, the obligation of these banks to make transaction data available uh, to other financial service providers, uh, such as innovative fintech companies. And this comes together with um, a very significant uh, a package of remedies um, really tailored to give consumers and small businesses the information they need to make an informed choice and prompting them almost to, uh, to make the choice, uh, overcoming therefore their inertia. So that is a proper competition remedy, may work well or not, it's too early to say, but that is a competition remedy as opposed to the right to portability. And um, so my second point was actually uh, using privacy regulation uh, to enhance competition, remedy perceived competition problems. It's not likely to work very well. And the third point I'd like to make uh, um, uh, in really a, a very, very short time is that uh, one, more, one more thing to bear in mind is this idea of um, uh, uh, privacy regulation and privacy standards as a parameter of competition and whether a breach of privacy regulation can be an element of a case of anti-competitive abuse or anti-competitive practice against, um, uh, against a, a company, for example, a dominant company. And there is an ongoing investigation against Facebook in Germany precisely on this theory. Now, for example, the Italian Competition Authority has addressed that very problem, the use by Facebook of uh, data from third-party websites, you know, when, when the consumer is on third-party websites rather than on Facebook itself um, under consumer protection legislation. And therefore, my third and final point is that actually um, while uh, uh, business and markets and perhaps life becomes more complex uh, and privacy and data do become uh, an element of competition analysis in, in so many ways, I think there is a point in going back or perhaps sticking to basics and keeping these different tools that we have, uh, privacy enforcement, whatever it might be, um, private enforcement or regulation, competition enforcement uh, or, or in consumer enforcement clearly distinct to avoid, to avoid costly mistakes. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, we turn next to uh, Garrett Johnson, who we heard from, uh, from Boston University, we heard from earlier uh, today. Um, we actually got an audience question about what is the impact of GDPR on innovation and competition, and how can this be measured? And I think uh, uh, Garrett can say a little bit uh, uh, on, on that subject uh, from his perspective. Thank you. So yesterday, uh, several of you heard research from uh, Judge Yin and Wagman on the short-run effects of GDPR on technology venture investment. Uh, they found an 18% reduction in the number of weekly venture deals and a 40% reduction in the amount raised in an average deal following the rollout of the GDPR. Uh, that's obviously not great news. 
Um, today, I want to tell you about some uh, joint work that I have with uh, San Goldberg at Kellogg, who's in the audience, um, and Scott Shriver at Colorado, where we're looking at what happened online in Europe. Um, the first way we're going to look at this is we're going to look at uh, site visit and conversion outcomes on a panel of 2,300 websites. Uh, the second thing we're going to look at is uh, third-party interactions and tracking on a panel of 28,000 websites. And the final thing we're going to look at is competition by looking at the, the number of sellers that uh, publishers in Europe use, uh, looking at a panel of uh, over 100,000 websites. So I want to stress at the outside that this is uh, not so much uh, research that's hot off the presses as much as uh, research that hasn't even made it to the presses. Um, so take things with a, a grain of salt. This is a case of, I think, uh, supply rising to meet demand. So uh, uh, first I want to talk about the, the, the results for the um, uh, panel of websites and site visits and conversions. Um, for 2,300 websites, we see something like a 10% reduction in site visits. Um, and something like a 10% reduction in um, sales or conversions um, as res uh, after the GDPR. Um, and this is of the 900 websites that are in our data that, that have that information. Now, these findings are very provocative and very alarming, so I want to give you three big caveats. Uh, the first is that we're still trying to determine to what extent this is a real decrease and not an artificial decrease of a reduced ability to collect data in Europe. Um, the second thing is that when you're looking at the effects of a policy that, uh, a, that um, impacts an entire continent at a certain period in time, it's pretty hard to find a good control that uh, can give you a benchmark to evaluate that with. We're using uh, the 2017 data in Europe as, as a benchmark. And finally, um, this data by nature is extremely noisy, and so um, we, we need to be careful in drawing strong conclusions for that. Now, um, the, the second thing that we looked at is compliance by EU uh, websites in terms of the amount of third-party interactions or tracking that happens on those websites. Um, the way that I went about this is I collected data from the top 2,000 websites in every um, European country, EU country, as well as Canada, the US, and globally for an uh, overlap of 28,000 websites. And what I did is I represented myself as being a French user via VPN and collected using software every single third party that interacted with my browser, whether it be through um, cookies or through HTTP requests or JavaScript. And um, what I saw there is um, in the week after the GDPR, there is a 12% reduction in um, uh, third party interactions relative to the days leading up to the GDPR. And because everyone is sort of scrambling to get um, in accordance with the GDPR, you might expect that that number continue to go down. And in fact, that is what happened in Denmark. Um, that is what happened in uh, the Netherlands. But if you look at uh, Bulgaria and Poland and, and other countries, um, you actually see that it goes down and then it bounces right back up again. Um, so you look at an average of, of all my data, um, these third party interactions by now are essentially where they were um, pre-GDPR levels. So um, one thing that I want to do is try to see what explains whether or not these increases happened or not, um, because we think it has something to do with basically how afraid um, these companies are of regulators in their local area, even though the GDPR was supposed to be uniformly uh, applied. And so we used a survey metric of data providers um, that tried to quantify just how lenient they think their, their um, regulator is. And that turns out to be a really great predictor of whether or not um, um, tracking or third-party interactions went back, back up uh, post-GDPR. And that's after accounting for um, wealth and for accounting for um, ad blocking and characteristics of the website, like the amount of content and ads that they, that they have on the website. Um, another finding that we, we found is that um, the place where you saw the most reduction in third-party tracking was actually where there were the least um, European users, so the websites that had 10% or less European users had the largest reduction, mm -hmm. um, and we think that that's probably a, a result of a set of incentives that says that you will um, receive a fine of 4% of your global revenue um, if you violate the rules. Now, um, lastly, when it comes to, to competition on this point, um, the, the evidence is pretty mixed. If you split by top 10 um, tracking firms versus below, um, the top 10 were affected or reduced less than the, the bottom um, 10 or uh, the, the firms below the, the top 10 trackers. But if you split it by top 50 versus outside that top 50, that, that pattern reverses. Um, and so we, we have a, a third piece of, of, of evidence that, that speaks to the competition issue that I'll go through briefly, and that is that 
we thought that when um, you tell firms that um, they're going to be liable for sharing data with others and that they need to get consent, that um, firms would be less likely to interact with, with more firms. And so we looked at a self-reported measure of the number of ad sellers that European web publishers use um, called the ads.text initiative. And there we basically found nothing, which we were quite surprised by. So there's a small increase in the number of sellers um, that these websites are using, but you know there's a small increase in Canada too. And, and so there was really um, not there was there was no sort of massive decrease as as we might expect it. So uh, with that, I'll pass things on. Thank you for uh, giving us a preview of this uh, very interesting research, and you all heard it here first. Um, so next we turn to uh, Jim Halpert to get a, a practitioner's perspective. Jim is a well-known privacy uh, lawyer at DLA Piper and uh, has been involved in, in some of these issues for quite some time. Jim? Thank you, Hugh, and thanks for the opportunity to speak. I'm actually here today with the head of our Polish IPT practice, Eva Koroska Tober, who can speak further about Poland and, and the enforcement environment, which I think is a little bit different than, than the assumption behind the, the survey data. But um, it's nonetheless a very interesting survey. I'd make a few points that are more from a practitioner's sort of practical perspective. I've seen that for non-EU entities that, are, that have some presence in Europe uh, but do not have a lot of users, GDPR, the decision about whether to comply with GDPR if they were a website operator was a fairly clear decision for those who were not among the largest. And you can see data that the top th of third of the 100, or a third of the top 100 websites responded to GDPR by blocking EU visitors. And there, there are a number of, new, of articles about this. Um, the same thing is true of nearly 100 public-facing websites that a uh, survey that by data.verifiedjoseph.com came up with as well. So you see a parade of entities that just were not making that much money in Europe who said it's not worth it. So from a competition perspective, you know, probably the crafters of GDPR smiled at that because they don't really want competition in necessarily coming from the United States in the internet market, but nonetheless, there, there clearly was, at least when this regulation went into effect, a drop-off effect on public-facing websites that just didn't want to deal with the GDPR compliance through their ecosystem. Another thing to think about is that requirements for granular consent necessarily disadvantage entities that have fewer customers and need to rely on the notice and consent being floated by the uh, website operator and put them in a, a comparatively weaker uh, position to craft the consent that will fit their business models. Um, we, we see this also in, in, in terms that, and this is not something that's public, but the term, the processing term, processor terms or subprocessor or co-controller terms that were passed down to smaller entities by bigger entities under GDPR. The fact was that smaller entities took an awful lot of obligations contractually and an awful lot of liability that they probably were not able to handle. But nonetheless, the formality of the processing agreement um, uh, led to bigger entities exercising their greater bargaining power to drive through obligations to be able to absolve themselves of compliance. Another thing to look at in um, uh, the ecosystem environment like the advertising ecosystem and Chuck Curran who represents better ads is in, in the back and does a lot of work. I know that Lee Freund was here as well, is that um, the GDPR did create at least temporary disruptions with a sort of whipsaw effect where the um, and entities, there were several of them that are very big in the internet advertising env uh, environment and were under a lot of scrutiny by regulators. So they needed to, you know, to break it, uh, make an omelet, you need to break a few eggs. And they needed to come up with a compliance structure that was auditable and ecosystem providers needed to conform to that. I would suggest that a less granular set of obligations on downstream entities that was more outcomes based would be a better way to avoid uh, drop off and disruption 
in the ecosystem. And I, I'm not here to praise the CCPA, the California Privacy Law, in all aspects. There are ways in which it's very poorly drafted. But its processor obligations, its service provider obligations, are very outcome-based. Really, the question for the service provider, they need to sign an agreement saying to be a service provider and then be outside of the disclosure obligations under the CCPA. They need to promise only to process the data, store it, use it uh, for the duration of the, of the service contract that they have with the entity that is the business that's giving them the data and not to sell it or use it or disclose it for any other purpose. And that may be a more neutral way to get to an outcome where uh, the core interest, which is in preventing further pollution, if you will, of the uh, data, uh, personal data ecosystem out there, is achieved without being so granular on oblig for obligations that need to be passed along to smaller entities that really can't say no. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Um, so we've heard a little bit about the role of the of the regulator in the in, in the EU system under GDPR, and there's a Data Protection Authority or DPA every country, so it's only fitting we include a DPA perspective on the panel. So we turn next to Simon McDougall from the UK's uh, DPA, which is called the Information Commissioner's Office. Um, and uh, Simon uh, even has innovation in, in the, his title, so he seems perfect for this panel. So we <laughs> give him a couple of minutes to describe their perspective. Thank you. Um, uh, I've had this, this title, Executive Director of Technology Policy and Innovation, for a whole five weeks now. Uh, uh, before that, I, uh, I ran a privacy consulting practice uh, for Promontory, which is now uh, part of IBM, uh, and spent uh, most of the last few years uh, helping uh, large, uh, large corporations uh, with their GDPR implementations. So my comments now are informed as much by what I saw in my time in the private sector uh, as now. Um, I, I want to just first talk to a couple of points that have already arisen. Um, First of all, you could get the impression that, the, that the Europe was some kind of blazing wasteland on May the 26th, mm. uh, and nobody got any ads, and that was all terrible. Um, it, it really was not like that, and I don't think anybody noticed any particular difference in their experience um, on a day-to-day -day basis. <coughs> I also think that, um, to quote Sharon Lai uh, in his conversation with Henry Kissinger about the French Revolution, um, it, it's too early to tell mm. what the impact of the GDPR will be. Uh, and I think Rahul made a great point on, the, uh, on the, the last panel that uncertainty is as damaging uh, as, as prescriptive regulation. And what we definitely saw leading up to the GDPR and then afterwards was a lot of uncertainty. So it'll be really interesting to see how this data pans out uh, over, um, over the next few months and uh, indeed the next couple of years uh, because right now the GDPR seems to be going okay, to be honest. Um, and in terms of the market in, the, in, in Europe, you know, again, I'm not hearing anything terrible from my old private sector clients. Uh, I want to mention uh, one thing in relation to competition and then a couple of points around innovation as well. Uh, the, the point I'll raise on competition is just to note in passing that the GDPR, GDPR has some interesting mechanisms in it which I think have the possibility of really enhancing competition in the medium term. And that's codes of conduct and certifications. Uh, and the difference there is that a code of conduct in GDPR speak uh, is where a body such as a trade association creates some rules specific to its uh, vertical uh, and then a, a data protection authority will sign them off. Uh, a, a certification involves certification bodies and a more complicated scheme. We're seeing a lot of interest right now in codes of conduct, uh, less so in certifications because I think they'll take longer to, to implement. Uh, I think if um, for certain markets we get simple, practical codes of conduct, then that could be very helpful to new entrants because it will reduce its uncertainty and add clarity. Conversely, if we end up endorsing, as European data protection authorities, we end up endorsing very complicated codes of conduct, obviously that could provide a barrier to entry by just creating uh, more rules around particular um, uh, environments that, that are... Uh, deterring to smaller firms. So that's something we need to look at, but I think good, clear codes of conduct can be very helpful in these circumstances to reduce this uncertainty. But I want to spend a couple of minutes also talking about the innovation side of, of my job, because I think often today competition and innovation have been conflated in different ways. 
So let's talk about innovation in terms of its classical definition, whereby we're talking about the process where we go from somebody having a really bright idea, some people in a garage, an innovation hub of a large firm, an academic, all the way through to realization, i.e. a retail product goes out or a government does something for its citizens, which is cool and wasn't done before. Let's talk about innovation there. My role is new at the ICO and I'm building an innovation department, which we're still staffing with some amazing people, but we're very focused on innovation as innovation. Uh, and we're doing a whole range of different things to promote it. Um, three areas quickly in the time I have. Firstly, we're engaging with thought leaders around key areas such as artificial intelligence, digital ethics, where a lot of this innovation is happening. So we've been very active in helping set up the Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation in the UK, uh, which is a government-backed centre which is just being uh, founded now as we speak. Uh, and we're working with the Alan Turing Institute around explainable artificial intelligence and how we can help ensure there's trust in AI. I think there's a huge risk here that AI goes the same way as GM. Well, hey, you guys have got it. We haven't got GM in um, uh, genetically mod modified foods in Europe because everyone lost trust in that particular technology. AI could easily go the same way unless the industry explains to people what on earth is going on. So explainable AI is a big thing. Secondly, we are building a regulatory innovation hub whereby we're accepting that we are a horizontal regulator in a world of vertical regulators. And when a firm comes with an innovative idea to our financial services regulators or our telecoms regulators um, and uh, they have questions, we then can help make sure there's a one-stop shop for that regulatory question by being in the room with that regulator or being at the end of the phone to help them. Thirdly and finally, uh, we are setting up a regulatory sandbox uh, leveraging the success of financial services regulatory sandboxes with innovative firms, whereby firms can apply to be in the sandbox, and uh, if we say yes, they develop a close, continuous, collaborative relationship with, the, with, in this case, us, the ICO, where they can take their project, they can pilot it, uh, and they can work with us so that uh, they end up doing something exciting and innovative, but in a privacy-respectful way. So my, my key message here is that as a privacy regulator, and I think this is applicable to privacy regulators around the world, we do not have to be passive here. We can be on the front foot and we can do interesting things to promote both competition and innovation. And there I'll stop. Thanks. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, uh, and particularly the description of the many interesting projects that the ICO has, has underway. Um, we have next uh, uh, Reiner Wesley, a um, uh, friend and colleague from the EU mission, and uh, before that, formerly of, of DG Comp, and uh, we give the floor to him. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to this panel. Is it on? Yes. Uh, it will not surprise you that we in, the, uh, in Brussels at the European Commission are following these hearings with uh, big interest, because most of, if not all of the topics discussed here are equally uh, of high relevance also for our internal discussions. Um, originally, my intention was actually to start off to give you a very brief overview of how we deal at um, DG competition in, in uh, the, at the European Commission with uh, big data, data, and uh, data protection. In our commission, um, press the microphone on. I, it is on. It is. Yeah. It tells me. Uh, with uh, data protection. Uh, for specific markets, um, but taking that this was part of an earlier session this morning already and taking our time constraints, I will limit myself to one key observation. We have gathered over the years a lot of experience, uh, in particular in merger cases, of how to assess data and big data markets. Um, but what we see uh, recently is that uh, the assessment of data protection in our um, competition and merger analysis is getting ever more important. And the reason for this is certainly that consumers give always more importance to their protection of the data, um, and we can see that, and this is re reflected in our decisions. Uh, and actually, it also mirrors my own experience. Five or ten years ago, I think uh, I would have not have cared so much about what happens to my personal data, but nowadays I think if I have an option where I can go for a safer uh, and more protective uh, measure, then I would always try to opt for that. Um, as our competition uh, commissioner, Margrethe Bestager, put it already in 2016, uh, we would not use uh, our competition enforcement to fix privacy problems, um, but that does not mean that we will not, uh, ignore genuine competition problems just because they have a link to data. Which brings me now to the topic of today's panel, 
and the question of uh, the actual or potential effect on innovation and competition of the GDPR. And I would uh, like to structure it in, in three points, uh, basically where we are coming from. Uh, as uh, Renato already said uh, before, uh, data protection in Europe is nothing new. We have uh, had rules for many, many years, uh, over two decades. And uh, intuitively, uh, intuitively, I think uh, that would speak for uh, questioning whether there should be a negative impact on uh, competition and innovation in the first place. Uh, then I will look at where we are now. We have uh, created a very strong level playing field across uh, Europe, where, which reduces compliance cost and uh, reduces uh, burden for companies. And looking forward, um, I think I will add some words on uh, the entry barriers which are allowed uh, through the GDPR, as also Renato mentioned already, uh, uh, we have uh, built in uh, innov uh, innovation, innovation incentives thanks to privacy by default and by design. So I think in the end and eventually the GDPR should actually stimulate innovation and competition. So um, if I look at where we're coming from, in the past uh, we had a directive and a patchwork of uh, many national uh, laws. Since the beginning of the data protection reform uh, and the discussion of, of the reform, we saw that competition and innovation were at the heart of these discussions. The aim was to create a level playing field addressing the consumer trust deficit and simplifying and harmonizing the data protection legal framework as a key element of the digital single market, which is, as many of you will know, one of the key priorities of the uh, current European Commission. In other words, the patchwork that existed in the past has been replaced by one single pan-European law. Instead of having to deal with 28 different data protection laws and 28 ways of uh, interpretation, since May last year, uh, this year, operators doing business in Europe can uh, rely on one set of uniform rules. This brings me to where we are now. The GDPR has put these rules into a new shape, making them more coherent and directly applicable. Of course, we had heard many concerns, and I hear them uh, yesterday and today again, that certain uh, economic actors say that their business models will actually not work with the GDPR uh, and uh, that they are um, uh, com competitively disadvantaged with the big and uh, foreign uh, operators. Um, as already also mentioned, it is probably too early to make a long-term assessment at this point in time to see whether these claims are actually true. We have seen fear of some companies uh, because of uh, compliance, because of uh, risks of fines, uh, and there has been a lot of uncertainty, but uh, I think the generally uh, first evidence that we see points in a different direction. For many companies, compliance with the GDPR has actually brought along an opportunity to bring their data house into order. They could look at what kind of uh, data they actually collect, they could see what they use it for, how they assess it, and how they process it. For some of them, this brought actually new opportunities because they could find out what data they possess and use it in new, more innovative forms. In doing these checks, and that was also already mentioned, some of them have also eliminated unnecessary uh, risks, which we see in the recent past uh, that ri um, risks of data breaches can lead to high uh, financial and reputational costs. I think there was a study last week which tried to put a, tri a price tag on um, the, the loss of revenues uh, due to uh, reputational risk, uh, which was a multi-billion sum. Without consumers' trust in the way their data is handled, there can be no sustainable growth in the way uh, of our data-driven economy. So the GDPR has harmonized and simplified data protection, and this in return has uh, led to a significant reduction of compliance cost and administrative burden. I think these are very tangible direct results and benefits for, in, in particular, smaller and foreign companies which want to be active in the European market and which do not have the resources to uh, make studies of, of legal requirements of uh, different national uh, systems. Now, looking forward, um, the GDPR has, uh, as Oli mentioned, uh, introduced mechanisms to lower entry barriers. We uh, look at Article 20 of the GDPR, uh, which stimulates and facilitates the entrance of new players. Um, the right to data portability has a clear competition rationale, and there I would uh, slightly contradict Renato, um, because I think you can draw a comparison to the uh, right of uh, number portability in the telecommunication sector, and we saw that this was a very stimulating effect, and we hope to replicate this effect also for data um, uh, portability. Thank you.
Um, we turn now to our um, final panelist, who is uh, Orla Linsky, a law professor and data protection expert at uh, London School of Economics, who I, I see way down there, and uh, we'll give her uh, perspectives now. Thank you, Hugh, and many thanks for the opportunity to provide some remarks uh, for this hearing today. Um, I think before I, I start, I just want to highlight again the very different constitutional context in which this discussion has occurred in Europe because of the, the presence in the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights of both a right to privacy but also a separate right to data protection. And uh, as a result, there is um, a, an, a legal obligation to have data protection rules in place to protect the data of European individuals. And I think that's an important differentiating factor between uh, this discussion in the EU and this discussion in the US. I'd like to, to think about two interrelated claims about how EU data protection rules can impact on competition and on innovation. And the first is a very obvious one, which is that the GDPR and its predecessor, the 1995 Data Protection Directive, formed part of the legal and regulatory landscape that competition authorities needed to take into account when undertaking competitive assessments and thinking about the application of competition policy. Now, this sometimes led to the incorrect assumption that the mere existence of data protection regulation meant that these markets, data markets, were functioning effectively for consumers. And I think you can see this, um, for instance, in some of the European Commission's decisions. So if you look at merger decisions like Google Snuffy or Microsoft LinkedIn, you see before the GDPR had even been signed off that the Commission is saying that the mere potential for the, the right to data portability to be exercised meant that consumers couldn't be locked in. Now, I think that's an erroneous assumption to, to work from because we have uh, clear empirical evidence that there are many impediments to individual control over personal data. So my own research has focused on the, the role um, and the limits of informational self-determination in European data protection law. But also I think we have um, a documented cycle of what Farrell, a, a former director of the Bureau of Economics here, described as a dysfunctional equilibrium. And that is the fact that firms who do wish to differentiate their offerings on the basis of more privacy protective products find that there is little incentive to do so because consumers have already resigned themselves to the fact that there is no better offering out there and this creates a vicious cycle. And I think we have that, 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 that idea was proposed in 2012 and if you fast forward to this year, the consumer organisation which in the UK document a similar, similar phenomenon when they say that um, we have a situation of rational disengagement from data protection policies and that is that in fact the rational thing for a consumer to do might be to simply not engage with those policies in certain circumstances because they are so complex and the ability to control data is so limited. So then the second point I want to make is, um, or a query I want to ask is, what might GDPR do in order to improve this situation? And here I think that although the core system of checks and balances in EU data protection law uh, has remained unchanged from the 1995 rules, the GDPR introduces some small but significant substantive changes that have the potential to really clean up the European data ecosystem, and in particular online. And so I just want to highlight one that has um, currently become the, the focus of complaints to European data protection regulators. And so if we, if we consider how data is processed or the legal basis for data processing, one of the most commonly used ones online is consent. It's not the, the sole legal basis for processing, but it is one of the mo most frequently used. And consent has to be freely given, specific and informed. So far, so similar to the 1995 rules. However, what the GDPR does do is specify that freely given consent, um, in, in considering whether consent is freely given, uh, you need to take it utmost account of whether or not the performance of the contract is made conditional on the processing of consent that is, or of data that is not necessary. And so here the idea is that you will um, use uh, or acknowledge that consent is not freely given if it leads to unnecessary data processing and if therefore consumers can't um, access services or goods that they wish to access as a result. 
So this conditionality requirement is in fact a presumption. So there's a presumption that if access is conditional on unnecessary data processing, that consent is unlawful. That therefore has the potential to seriously um, alter the, 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 the way in which data-driven um, and in particular uh, data-driven advertising mo models and in particular programmatic advertising is operated in Europe. Because if the European Data Protection Board, the new agency for data protection in Europe, takes a hard line or a strict interpretation of this provision, it could say that um, data as counterperformance for the offering of a particular goods or service is not necessary for the performance of the service. And we have several opinions of its predecessor, the Article 29 Working Party, to indicate that that's the, th the way in which it is thinking. And this, I think, would then push us towards a model of advertising in Europe that is no longer um, behavioural and programmatic, but rather contextual, as was, was highlighted in the previous panel. And just to say, um, finally, because I need to wrap up, that the, the, this, these sm small but significant substantive changes are coupled with very significant enforcement changes. And... Um, the fines, the 4% of annual global turnover have received all of the attention, but in fact, in my opinion, what's likely to be far more significant is the creation of a new agency, the European Data Protection Board, in order to ensure consistency across, across Europe of decision making, but also the potential to mandate um, a representative organisation to take actions on your behalf. Um, which is provided for, for instance, under Article 80 of the GDPR. And so we have the potential also here for private litigation in order to really render individuals' data protection rights more effective. And then I think we'll be in a, in a, in a different data-driven environment. Thank you very much for those comments. And I think that these and some of the earlier comments remind us that, um, that here we are dealing both with some different constitutional contexts, as Renato and, and Orla mentioned, some different administrative contexts, the, the kind of comatology of the, the, um, of the system in Europe for, for deciding the sort of the rules and also different enforcement contexts. There's a reference to the, to the, uh, the uh, fines and, and the, what has been added in GPR on, on that subject. I'd like to take up first the issue that you just raised about the European Data Protection Board and the other sort of related aspects of this system that deal with interpreting the the law and how um, that looks. How um, this is a this is a 99 article a sort of document. It's a long uh, thing, the GDPR, but it has a number of provisions that deal with interpretation. How important is interpretation to the um, the effect of GDPR on competition and innovation, and how uh, fit for purpose is the mechanism that's been set up, the European Data Protection Board and, and the DPAs uh, within that. Um, maybe I'd start with uh, Simon and then Jim and then others who might want to comment. I, th I think having the consistency mechanisms in place is, is critical. Uh, and, and to echo some of the other speakers, we shouldn't forget that both uh, this regulation and also the preceding 95 directive, you know, were explicitly around uh, around having the free movement of data around Europe, as well as with the regulation then introducing privacy as a, as a fundamental right as well. So it has always been around the, those, both those mechanisms and having a level playing field across Europe. Uh, we, have a, we had a really practical problem in the build-up to GDPR where, quite rightly, many local data protection authorities were issuing lots and lots of guidance to help their, their national organizations, all the firms they regulated, get up to speed with GDPR. Uh, for, uh, for international organizations, that meant there was an awful lot of uh, different guidance to keep track of, and with the best will in the world, sometimes there was variation. Uh, we've just had the EDPB uh, provide uh, guidance on uh, one particular area, which is around uh, rationalizing the shopping list of conditions that might mean a firm has to undertake a DPIA, a data protection impact assessment, where there were differing lists across different countries. That's really practical, helpful stuff. So we do need these mechanisms, be, and over time, hopefully, we'll see a lot of these wrinkles be smoothed out. Um, this is a great example. Of Sorry, uh, Simon offered a great example of the work that the EDPB needs to do, but the fact remains that the much ballyhooed one-stop shop and harmonized set of rules that Renner described did not exist in 
uh, as to key elements of ambiguity prior to adoption of or GDPR going into effect. And the cost of GDPR implementation um, exceeded $10 million for most firms of, uh, uh, that were multinational and had more than uh, 500 million in sales. So the result was significant uncertainty with uh, our firm developed a DPI assessment tool and had to customize it before this guidance came down to different requirements in different states. And this is a very common process. With regard to uh, personal data breach, Eva and I were speaking this morning, and you know, one assumes that, that uh, you know, risk to fundamental rights and freedoms of the data subject would be a uniform breach notice requirement across Europe. Well, in Poland, the regulator will, when given the advance notice, will not say in any circumstance, even a trivial one, that there isn't a uh, risk to the fundamental rights and freedoms of individuals, which is a different standard than in other EU member states. So the, the, really the EDPB needs to be very active to uh, counter the centripetal forces that are at work among autonomous DPAs. I'd also add that there is no uh, uniformity with regard to issues like children's consent, uh, labor laws, the German uh, uh, implementation of GDPR contained a whole separate labor code, labor privacy code that was enacted. So uh, while I don't think that actually GDPR offers a good model of uniformity at this point um, for the United States to look to in its uh, eventual privacy regulation. And while I'm very sympathetic to data portability and many of the other points that Rainier mentioned, I think it's, it's really worth looking at the EDPB as a work in progress to try to fulfill the idea of a uniform set of rules across Europe. Thank you. Uh, I think Reiner wanted to comment and then Garrett. Well, yes, I, I think I can confirm that uh, obviously uh, uh, current uh, um, definition and, and uh, way of interpretation of the GDPR is extremely important, but we have seen also from the EBDB that uh, I think throughout the last months there has been guidance. Uh, there have been, uh, I think, a total of uh, 18 guidance papers uh, in the meantime published, um, which uh, builds on top of the guidance which was uh, given previously already by the Article 29 Working Party. So um, that is obviously a, a f first uh, challenge also to see where the, the guidance is most important in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, and to the uncertainty uh, which is and was in the market, I, I think uh, that is probably normal uh, with a, a big uh, new regulation uh, like the one that we saw. But uh, on the other hand, what we can see is that there have been certain uh, companies uh, which have decided to place uh, safe in the first place, uh, said that they would uh, suspend for a certain time uh, their activity vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Europe, uh, would block uh, European uh, customers. But what we see now is actually already a trend that most of these uh, pages are in the meantime accessible again, which shows that we have to clearly distinguish between the very short-term effects, mm. uh, the mid-term and the longer-term effects, and that is exactly also where we then have to focus our uh, guidance, I think. Absolutely, I, I totally agree. Thank you. Uh, uh, Garrett and then Renato, I'm sorry, I meant. So I think the, the question of interpretation is a really important one because, you know, we're here talking about this because um, the U.S. And, and certainly many business leaders or some, some business leaders are calling for GDPR style regulation in, in uh, the United States. So um, the reason interpretation is difficult is that um, as someone said, I think Simon said, you know, on May 26th, Europe didn't burn down. Um, now, it would be hard to conclude from that that there were no impacts of GDPR. Certainly, the, the research that was done yesterday and some of my research uh, suggests that there are some, some impacts of, of uh, the GDPR, and some of those are uh, troublesome. Um, but a, a larger issue is that, you know, what we have yet to see is an enforcement action in Europe that clarifies some of these issues. So I think, you know, Orla brings up a really good point about uh, the, the state of programmatic advertising in Europe. Um, currently, the sort of de facto uh, way that most websites have handled this is an, is an opt-out that uh, notice that shows up when you arrive on their website. And basically 90% of people are consenting or not, you know, going through the process of opting out. Now, the laws, as you, as you say, if the um, regulators want to take a, a hard uh, take on this, um, the laws pretty, pretty clearly say that uh, they want opt-in consent that's uh, specific to purposes. So imagine as you're a consumer, you need to check uh, 
you know, 50 different um, companies that get to know your website, get to know your, that you visit a website and eight different purposes, uh, you're going to be checking a lot of boxes. And of course, that's going to mean that, you know, basically no one's going to be checking these boxes. And <laughs> then you'd see a, a very different um, effect of the GDPR on, on the web. Um, so, so I think, you know, there's this, the, the truth will continue to, to evolve here. Thank you. Rana? Um, yes, very briefly on, on this point, and coming, from, coming to that from a competition perspective, I think given the regulatory setup in Europe, what is very important and is happening uh, uh, to, to an extent is that competition authorities and um, uh, data protection regulators talk to each other. Mm, of course, interagency cooperation always comes at a cost in terms of resources and time, but I think it is very important, mm. especially if, uh, as Rainer was saying, uh, uh, certain of the provisions of the uh, data protection of the GDPR uh, are to be interpreted in a way that fosters competition. I, mm, you know, I'm, I'm very happy that the right to portability is there, um, obviously, I'm just saying that it is not a panacea for, 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 for competition problems in, in these markets where switching its law. Data are a little bit more complex than just a six or seven, eight digit number to, to, to port. And for example, where interpretation will be important, and we have seen already good evidence that we are going towards that, that, in, that direction is, you know, let's interpret, for example, the right to data portability in a way which is more conducive to competition. The, the regulation says data provided by the individual, well, clearly a broader interpretation of that provided by, which includes as much as the data which is necessary for others to compete as possible, that would be a good thing for competition. So I think uh, th th this point is quite important. And Thank you. Yeah. Uh, let me turn to an uh, another subject that often comes up in connection with GDPR, and that is the up to 4% of total worldwide annual turnover as potential sanctions which has already been mentioned in the conference several times, um, uh, uh, even uh, outside this panel. Um, what, what effect do those provisions have potentially on innovation and competition? Are there certain effects, uh, either pro or con, of having these, um, I think anyone would describe them as, indeed, I think even the, one of the authors of GDPR described them as heavy sanctions. Uh, Orla. Well, I, I think the, the fines were initially modelled, in fact, on antitrust fines and with the, the antitrust and the competitional provisions as the source of inspiration for that. However, I do think regulators, um, including the ICO, for instance, in the UK, have been very quick to point out that they will continue to work with those data controllers and data processes processors that are endeavouring to comply with the regulation and that fines are kind of a, a backstop here. Um, but as I said, I, th I think there are other mechanisms such as the potential for strategic litigation that is provided by the regulation that will lead to, um, as we were just discussing, more interpretive clarity. And if I can just come back to the point um, that Garrett made about the problematic um, impact of GDPR, well, if that is fewer third party trackers, well, again, that, that's a question of whether or not you think that is problematic, because in fact, at the moment, there is a complaint pending before the ICO in the UK and the Irish Data Protection Commissioner that the entire real-time bidding system is inconsistent with many core principles of GDPR, including data minimization, fairness, transparency, and many others. And that is a question then of, of looking at the entire um, system that is in place and seeing whether or not that's data protection compliant. And then on the issue of less investment, um, which um, the Wagman paper mentioned yesterday, I think this comes back to what Simon said, which is it, it depends on whether or not we can encourage investment in privacy protective um, technologies and privacy enhancing technologies. For instance, that paper doesn't consider at all the, the jobs that will be created for data protection officers and, and others. So I think a narrow focus on simply the fines and the sanctions ignores all of these other potential mechanisms for interpretation and innovation. Um. I, I'd like to make one quick point with regard to the group actions um, uh, point. I think that group actions can make sense, but they only make sense if the legal requirements are relatively clear. And it's a little bit troubling to think of group actions um, as the battering ram to get clarity, where in a system that is the the question of what's a legitimate interest of the data controller, for example, that overrides uh, 
the data protection interests of the data subject. That's something that the regulators really should provide guidance on. I, I totally agree with you that the question about how real-time exchanges work in relation to data protection, some guidance would be helpful on that. But a regulator really should be doing that sort of, of work. Uh, I'd also point out that there are very different sorts of incentives in class action litigation in the United States. And one shouldn't assume, as um, some do, that while GDPR has class action risk, that should be, for example, the mechanism for enforcement of the California Consumer Privacy Act or some federal law that was based on GDPR. There's no e-discovery regime in Europe, so the asymmetrical costs, which are about a million dollars any time a lawsuit is filed, that are only borne by the defendant, are very, very different. Um, there are also uh, are typically not the ability to obtain attorney's fees. And in fact, there are no damages available under GDPR group actions. So this is really an, an apples to oranges comparison. I just wanted to give that frame and then uh, give back the time. Okay. I just wanted to put one more question out. We only have a few minutes left. And, and that is, and I, I know one of our commissioners has sort of raised the issue of one thing that U.S. law does in, in some ways is to tailor the regulation that exists to the risk to tailor regulation to the risk. Um, is, that, is that important to do here? And does the GDPR do a good job of tailoring the regulation to the risks that exist? Uh, I, mean, Renata. Is, is, I, I, I think I can I have a first, first go at that. I mean, it's, uh, since the GDPR is actually a set of rules that in principle, I mean, there are, there are exceptions and modulations, but apply to all firms mm, and all data with a higher threshold for certain particularly sensitive data, such as health data, uh, uh, political opinions, et cetera. Um, in principle, it's not kind of a risk-based, outcome-based regulation, but it's a process-based regulation which applies across the board. So it doesn't really do so, but it, I think it's fair to say that the objective of the regulation, it was actually to set out that level playing field across the board, and that's where some of the problems that Garrett and others actually have um, um, have highlighted come from. Uh, in fairness, uh, though, fines are are geared to risk of harm too. So there there is some. If one looks at the eye popping sanctions, they do depend on high risk, for example. Okay, uh, Simon. Well, to echo what Jim was saying, yeah, there's, 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 there's different elements to the GDPR which do talk directly to, to considering risks. Um, the accountability regime is also uh, a, a new entrant, and I think it's critical to understanding how the GDPR can reward good behavior in firms large and small. Um, but I also want to say one word on, on just how this, this wraps into the, 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 the other risks that large organizations and small organizations deal with. And... Uh, reputational risk and what I think we're seeing on both sides of Atlanta right now is is a an ongoing breakdown in trust and that's an ongoing breakdown in trust in many ways but one of the ways is in how people whether people trust organizations in handling their data and, and that has a, a massive competitive impact and sometimes it's dragging all organizations down so it's not a relative thing but I think in many cases it favors the incumbent because people aren't going to make the leap into a new venture or a new technology if they don't really trust the environment they're in. And that's a critical part of the GDPR, that it can help rebuild trust and give people confidence in using new services because they believe their data will be handled responsibly. Okay. Uh, Orla, did you have a comment? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Reiner. <laughs> Uh, I, I would strongly agree to that. I mean, certainly it is process-based, and uh, what we think that the challenge is that the GDPR has to be sufficiently flexible actually to adapt itself to new risks, which we could not even predict at the time that the GDPR was planned. Um, uh, to, let's, let me make uh, one additional point. Um, we try, as from the first day uh, of, of the GDPR, to be as constructive as possible in the dialogue with, with uh, the, the economic operators on the market. I think by now it is clear that the, the GDPR is not used as a fining uh, sword, and, and, and uh, uh, so there is a very smooth phasing in, um, which is also uh, underlined by, uh, I, I don't know whether, whether you followed that, but uh, Commissioner Jurova just said that uh, in June next year, in 2019, we will have uh, one day, uh, uh, we will have a stock taking exercise um, in order not to wait until 2020, which would be the statutory uh, um, time for uh, when we have to report back to the European Parliament. So next year, uh, we should be able to address actually many of these questions and look into the effects on innovation and, and, um, and competition.
Okay. Any other last words on this? If yes, no, no, no. sorry. Just one point about fines. Actually, I think um, one positive aspect to the four percent uh, worldwide turnover fine is that actually an argument that obviously not too explicitly, but has been made, and I've heard in Europe that you know, you, you have to uh, use competition enforcement to, to in a sense, uh, uh, bolster uh, privacy regulation because fines were too low and ineffective, cannot be made any longer. So really, now you have effective sanctions on so in mergers, in abuse of dominance cases, etc. We shouldn't use competition policy to, uh, to, to punish and deter uh, <coughs> privacy uh, breaches. Okay. Um, I'd add one, one point with regard to big data and uh, data protection. Um, if we're talking about an incumbent that has a lot of personal data, um, it is difficult to open up that data in personally identifiable format to other competitors without having some data protection uh, measures in place. When, uh, so there is some inherent um, uh, tension here that's worth considering as we move into the pure antitrust analysis of this sort of problem. And it's, I just wanted to raise that as something to, to think about. Thank you very much. Three, two, one, we're out of time. Uh, so please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank <laughs> you.